Les économistes sont Economists une des were among the first communities of scientists who started working earliest on the problem of sustainable development. As early as the 70s, they did this through the controversy that was raised by the first report submitted to the Club of Rome, the Limits to Growth, also called the Meadows Report, after the name of the main scientist who took care of it. This report, published uh, at the time the Stockholm Conference took place uh, in the spring of 1972, and the report questioned what was said by growth economists, blaming them for not having thought about the long term, the limits in the long term after res natural resources are exhausted, questioning what was said by the main economists of the time. It was the period of the 30 glorious years, 1945, 1975, a great period of thought in Western countries. So growth at the time was one of the strong notions and people who thought about growth were very famous. And the first report from uh, sponsored by the Club of Rome questioned the theories and the beliefs that had to do with growth. And the same report was also based on work conducted by economists who were heterodox and criticized the work done by the others. Economists who took into consideration the uh, environmental issues as early as the 60s, there were signs showing that there was the other side of the medal of growth that had to do with environment, pollution, degradation, and exhaustion of natural resources. So the report sponsored by the Club of Rome was at the heart of the controversy and right at the heart of economy. It wasn't limited to the discussion between economists, but we need to understand that it uh, fueled again the discussion between economists who were in favor of growth and saw no limits to growth and certainly not with nature and the other economists who said hey be careful we cannot project ourselves into the future without thinking that we need to take the environment in account economists therefore started working on sustainable development relatively early very much along the same lines they continued the discussion when the Brundtland report was published 1987, Our Coming Future was the title, and the Brundtland Report, first of all, raised the number of problems that humankind was facing, economic problems, social problems, environmental problems, problems that are intertwined with each other, and one solution, a common solution to all the problems, acting in a systemic way, sustainable development. Economists were therefore among the first to get hold of the problem, sustainable development. And they did it in a way that was relatively similar to the way the discussion had started in the 70s after the first report uh, was published. One can understand the discussion when one understands the opposition between the model of weak durability and the model of strong durability. Weak durability or sustainability, as uh, we can understand, means that there are no strong constraints if we want to set ourselves on the path of sustainable development. The perspectives is that defended by mainstream economists, as they were called, for whom the uh, stakes of sustainable development was to uh, leave for future generations a stock of capital to ensure the well-being of generations one after the other. And within this stock of goods that allowed to produce goods and services, there are several types of capitals included. There, there's the natural capital, what is given to us by nature for our well-being, resources, and all kinds of other amenities, as the economists call them, the air we breathe. No need to produce the air. It's given to us by nature. This is natural capital. And there are other capitals created by man, machines, infrastructures. So one of the assumptions, one of the strong assumptions in the uh, weak sustainability model was to think that uh, forms of capitals could be replaced by another form of capital. 
And people thought that natural capital could be replaced by a kind of capital created by man. We are ruining, we're destroying the natural capital, consuming it partly and exhausting a number of resources. But it doesn't matter, according to the uh, mainstream economist theory. It's okay if we can leave for future generations additional quantities of man-made capital. So there is this assumption that natural capital can be replaced by man-made capital. There's a replaceability, and what matters is that we can forward capital to the future generations, and if we can give them even more, fair enough. But the basic assumption is that we leave for future generations the same quantity of capital that we have today, and at least that allows to maintain well-being from one generation to the next. So that's the strong assumption of weak sustainability. We understand the stakes here have no, no new characteristics. We accumulate capital, we invest, we invest again so that the capital is forwarded to the future generations. Of course, there are a few things at stake here, for instance, talking about technology, well, one should try and come up with green technologies, invest on green technologies, uh, public administration must make decision, decisions so that both public and private players can, uh, can integrate in the calculations the uh, fact that the uh, price of natural resources is increasing. But this is the uh, strong commensurability assumption. What does it mean? It means that all values of all kinds of objects can be translated with a single criterion, money. There are prices, and thanks to the prices, we know how much to invest, and natural capital will be progressively replaced by man-made man -made capital. That is the assumption of the weak sustainability model. There is also the other model, that of strong sustainability or durability, which means that the constraint bearing on the path towards sustainable development are much stronger than what is implied by the uh, public uh, economic policies. This is the uh, assumption defended by ecological economists. They believe that rather than talking about replaceability of the capital forms, there is complementarity between the various types of capital. If man has made capital machines, infrastructures, it is also it does also mean that it uses we use energy and natural resources. Of course, our computers are dematerialized, it's only information, but they do consume uh, raw materials and, quanti and a large quantity of energy, which means that we cannot replace the natural capital with man-made capital in a perfect way. They are complementary, but they, not re they do not replace each other. And therefore, if we choose this assumption in order to place ourselves on the path towards sustainable development, what we want to forward for future generations is not only a stock of man-made capital, but also a stock of natural capital, because otherwise the future generations will not be able to maintain their well-being level. Of very often we talk about the critical natural capital. The essential natural capital, which, if destroyed, will cause a crisis for humankind. Some resources will become exhausted and they will be replaced, but some elements are not replaceable. They're absolutely vital. And this is strong durability, a new constraint added in the policies to make sure that some natural assets are forwarded to future generations. We understand the stakes of the first report, the limits to growth, because we now need, know that we need to forward for future generations capitals, assets, natural assets that cannot be replaced. And if we need to manage the fact that there are different types of capitals, this leads us to take into consideration a diversity, a multiplicity of indicators to define the various types of assets. And this is what we call the weak commensurability assumption. Not everything can be reduced to money. Natural assets must also be assessed through a number of biophysical indicators. So this divide between weak sustainability and strong sustainability is a very large divide. It's almost like a revolution in 
economic thought. A very strong opposition, which leads to an economic debate, but it goes far beyond the work carried out by economists. There are other players who take this uh, divide and this debate into consideration. But the debate also hides a number of stakes. First of all, the first thing that is at stake is that this contradiction opposition is built on macroeconomic models. Economy is seen as a whole. There are large capitals or assets. We mix them together and we produce a quantity of well-being. We think as if society were a whole group of elements, but there are also limits to this kind of uh, train of thought because the notion of natural asset is not homogeneous. The resources we use could be fishes or trees or CO2. There is not one natural asset. There are several resources that are being used and managed by different people, different players, and they have different biophysical characteristics very different. And the players taking care of them, the rules and regulations managing them are very different from each other. Reasoning in terms of natural assets sooner or later will become difficult. And the matter of technical innovation, one of the main stakes in the debate between uh, strong durability and weak durability, do we have the technical solutions to replace natural assets with man-made assets? Well, the, the question is not raised in a general way. In one given sector, there are many innovations. In another sector, there are less innovations. The, the innovations found in one given industry are not the same as the ones found in a different industry. So if we want to move forward, we need to reach what we call the meso-economic level. We need to have a sectorial logic and some regulations were limited to a given sector or industry. The second the problem in the opposition between strong and weak durability is that it legitimates the notion of natural capital asset. Economists all agree that we can talk about natural capital. This is interesting because we talk about natural capital asset. But for economists, capital is something that you're supposed to keep. You're not supposed to eat it up. You're supposed to preserve it. It means that we consider nature as something pressure that should not be eaten away. But at the same time, nature can only be translated as a natural capital. Nature is only seen as a production element, something that provides well-being to humankind. We talk about uh, ecosystemic services nowadays, for instance, as if nature rendered services and we're only seen as something rendering services. Well, that's true, but it's, it shouldn't be a limitation. This should not be the only relationship we have with nature. Nature should not only be considered as an instrument or uh, something to produce with. Our relationship with nature is, goes well beyond that. And humankind has all kinds of nature uh, relationships with nature. So nature is uh, a notion used by Western countries, but in some populations, they don't talk about nature. They talk about something non-human. Nature is everything that is non-human. That's the way they call it. So natural assets are a notion that needs to be discussed and maybe criticized because it does not cover all of the relationships that we have with the non-human with nature. Maybe we should start talking about uh, heritage. Again, sustainable development is about uh, forwarding to future generation a legacy of natural capitals that are considered as a heritage, natural elements and identity elements as well. Maybe we should question the stakes here and talk about heritage and the natural heritage.